Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Julie Alcoholic? Julie. And yes, I'm short. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, okay, thank you, uh, Mason, for uh, inviting me to come up here and speak. And uh, I've never been uh, to this part of the world before, and uh, I know, I was very excited. And uh, it's really pretty, it's lovely. And uh, I want to thank Steve, I think, for picking me up from the airport. <laughs> He nearly killed me three times, but who's counting? <laughs> oh, my God, there's a car. It's a red light. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so, thank you. I met Steve in, uh, in Bermuda a couple of years ago. I was speaking, and James was speaking, and uh, Steve was there. And it, he's been really good at kind of keeping up with me and calling me on my anniversary and that kind of thing. So it's so lovely to be able to see him, um, I think, like three, three years ago we met. So that's kind of nice. And... Uh, you know, so my accent is Irish, and uh, and I have a bit of a cold. I'm trying to get over a cold, so I feel like I like I sound like I'm you're calling the hotline or something. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> turning myself on with this voice. You know what I mean? But uh, so I'm <laughs> maybe I'll buy my own CD. <laughs> so you know, <laughs> you know, I'm just uh, entertaining myself up here. I. Uh, it's nice to be here, and I and I like I said my accent's Irish, and it takes a little while to get used to the accent, and hopefully by the time I'm done, you'll you'll get it. I was speaking somewhere recently, uh, which should be nameless, and uh, um, a woman says to me, "You have an accent," and I said, I, "I do, yeah." And she says, "Well, where is it from?" And I said, it's, "Oh, it's Irish." And she goes, "Have you ever been?" <laughs> Like, it took everything in me just to go, yeah, I was, I was born there. Uh, like, like, what do you think I'm doing, going home watching BBC, kind of checking it out? I don't know. Yeah. So anyway, <laughs> I come from a big Irish Catholic family, and um, my mother had 13 children, and um, I know. And uh, I'm so disappointed. And uh, I'm the tenth. The, the seven passed away and the six of us alive. And um, my mother really should have never had children. She hasn't really got a maternal bone in her body. And um, she, knows, she knows it. It's not a news flash. And, uh, you know, she was in the, on, the, on the escalator with me one day. She came over to visit me from Ireland because um, where I was born. And um, <laughs> she looks like, what? And uh, and this heavily pregnant woman was coming up the other direction, you know. And my, and my mother looks at me and looks at her and goes, Jesus, someone had it in for her. <laughs> and I go, uh, uh, Mammy, maybe, maybe she wants to be pregnant. And she looked at me disgusted. Julie, no one wants to be pregnant. <laughs> so so I, t- I tell you that just so you get a feeling of how warm and fuzzy I am. <laughs> And how maternal I am, where I come from. So, you know, my mother left my father and um, we moved to London and um, she drank in this bar on a daily basis called the White Heart. And the locals used to call it Maggot's Corner because, you know, that's how we roll, right? And uh, after school, I'd bring me and my younger sister to go up there and we'd spend our evenings there and we'd spend our weekends there. And we'd, we'd either, we'd sit in the car and she'd bring us out a bag of chips and a bottle of Coke for dinner or we'd sit in the bar and she was generally the only woman in there and um, I, you know I learned at a very early age you know like if I sat on, on the, uh, an all Irish fella's knee he'd give me 50 pence or a swig of his beer and I'd like to think you know I, that could still happen you know I could still I could still pull out cause I might not get 50 pence but I might get a quarter or something you know uh, <laughs> I've been trying to keep my, my myself in good nick and uh, I figure I could pull off a quarter if I ever relapsed and um but, but I say that because because I learned at a very early age how to how to live in a bar like that. Like I'm very very comfortable. I'm a bar drinker. I'm a bar fly. I don't see the point in not being that unless I'm trying to uh, 
curve some of the consequences of bar drinking. And uh, I hate that when you come out of blackout and you're in the bar again. You're like, damn, how did I get here again? Last time I remembered I was in my room. It's like, oh my God. So that's just, just I, you know, there's nothing more I love than sitting at a bar stool and uh, drinking, listening to some country music and shooting pool and stay in there, stay in there. And uh, I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want you to speak to me. I just want to be there. And, um, because, you know, you annoy me. And, um, (laughs) you know, so so I started to kind of independently drink when I was like 10. And what that means is I started to steal booze from my mother's liquor cabinet. And uh, I was at home in Ireland in August, and she still has this liquor cabinet. And um, you open it, and you open it, and it's got like a magnet, and it makes a click, click noise. And I thought it was a gift from Jesus that I could open that without the magnets going off. Like I, I was skilled, like at an early age. <laughs> and, and my mother used to smuggle over um, your moonshine, what we call in Ireland is putcheen. And we used to, she used to smuggle over putcheen in statues of the Holy Virgin Mary. And um, <laughs> you know the water bottle statues? You know, you screw the head off Mary, you put a bit of holy water. <laughs> You drink it when you're feeling a little queer, and uh, I drank a lot of it. And uh, and uh, she'd empty out all the holy water, and she'd put in the putchine because it's clear like the moonshine. And um, and she put Mary's head back on, and and, we, uh, and we'd go through customs, you know, going from from Ireland to London. And she looked like just an an Irish religious woman with all these children and these statues of Mary in the back. <laughs> and it's hilarious, you know. I think of her back crazy, and. Um, and so I'd open that cabinet and I'd look for the crown, you know, on Mary's head. And, uh, and I'd find it and uh, I'd take Mary down, I'd screw the head off Mary. I'd have a swig, whatever, I'd have a swig of, a uh, swig of this butchie. And you actually can't breathe when you drink it. Uh, you're like, <gasps> like, like, you know the veins are popping out of your head, your eyes are going red. But you know it's going to be worth it if you just hang on in there, you know, just hang on in there. I'd put Mary's head back on and put her in the cupboard. And, uh, and I'd be delighted with myself for about 20 minutes. Like I'd be dancing around the kitchen. Like it's so good and I can breathe now. And, uh, and my uncle would have been over and I'd be smoking his cigar butts and uh, the little c- c- cigarettes and all that. And I'd be delighted for about 20 minutes and it'd wear off and I'd go back to the cupboard. Like that's how it was for me. Like when I think about my drinking... I don't know about this invisible line business. I don't know about that. I know when I started independently drinking, I wanted to do that all the time. Like in and my drinking, I can sum it up like this. Like when I'm not drinking, I'm thinking about drinking. And when I'm not drinking and thinking about drinking, I'm getting over drinking. Obsession, obsession, obsession. From the age of 10. And, um, and, and you know... Uh, you know, for, for me, I was very intense as a child. There was lots of stuff going on in, in my family home that should never go on. And, and I was, so I was really, really intense and concerned a lot. And when I drank, I suddenly didn't care about you, your sad little life and your sad little opinion. And I suddenly became arrogant, which I loved. I mean, I loved that kind of arrogance uh, like, and that indifference. You know, my first step four was super small, and I realized afterwards, because I was just so indifferent, I didn't care about you. I pretended I cared about you, but as soon as you left, you were gone out of my mind, and um, so it was small. I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't really care for people, and, um, you know, I started to kind of, and I always share this, and, and you don't have to identify if you're new, but I like to share it. It's amazing how many people identify, but as soon as I started drinking, I used to start cutting myself, take tapes and razor blades and anything to get my hands on and it was all a big secret it was all a big secret and so I did that all the way through my drinking and um, it, I would hide it all the time and so I share that with you because p- partly it kept me sober for a long time and secondly um, for me it was um, I was really unwell from the gate like really unwell from the gate and uh, when I look back at that I'm like yeah that's that's not social drinking and um <laughs> And I'd go to school, and there was a little corner store at school, and they'd, I'd go over at lunchtime on my lunch break, and they'd, when I was like uh, 13, 14, 15, they'd have, uh, I'd buy four cans of wine. Cans of wine. Like, 
I don't think I'd ever even really seen a grape, you know what I'm saying? But <laughs> I'd buy these four cans of wine, I'd bring them back to the toilets at school, because that's how I roll. Uh, and uh, like I drink them, I'd crack open those, and I'd get them down before. And, and I'm not a sharer, so <laughs> I was doing plenty of that at home. I'm not sharing my own booze, and, uh, and so I'd lock myself in the cubicle alone, and I'd drink these four, and I'd go back to class. Now I'm cursed being Irish because as soon as I have a drink, I go red from here, like all the way up, and my eyes are like backup lights or something like beep, or. <laughs> Or did you ever, have you ever seen like piss holes in the snow? Have you ever seen that? Like, like that. They're like, whoop, whoop, whoop. And so like I'm bright red and I'm like that. So I'm not hiding anything. I'm not, I'm not like a classy drunk. And, uh, and of course, if you haven't figured out already, I have a mouth and a half on me. So yeah, it's an issue. Uh, and so I got into a fair bit of trouble at school and, um, and I left, I left school and I went to, um, uh, I worked for a hospice, <laughs> sorry, I worked for a hospice in the East End of London. And um, my, I, I, I had no education when I left school. Education was not important. When I was raised, I was raised with a lot of, a lot of uh, violence and all that kind of stuff. But my mother was involved in some criminal activity. And, um, and so as long as we didn't bring the cops to the house, we were good. Education was not important. My father was illiterate. My mother was semi-illiterate. Nobody in my family has any education, so that wasn't important. You know, street smarts was important where I come from. And so, um, you know, school wasn't important. I was good at sports and that kind of stuff, but, and, and I, you know, whatever, music. But I was really not interested, and, and it was never encouraged. And so I left home. I left school and started working in the East End of London as an auxiliary nurse. And um, work, I worked in this hospice, and um, I was like two doors down. Do you remember, anybody ever remember that Dolly Parton song, Two doors down, they're laughing and drinking and having a party. And two doors up, they're not aware that I'm around. And I'd be like, that would be me because I was two doors down from the ward. And I'd be drinking, thinking that nobody's aware that I'm here and I'm on my own. <laughs> and I asked them if they would put me in, um, if they would put me on the floor. It was run by the Irish Sisters of Charity, this place. And I'd ask if they'd put me on the floor with all the other sisters because I was going to enter religious life. Yes. And... Uh, <laughs> And so uh, I, I <laughs> so scary. And, uh, and so they said, of course. And, um, and, and I was only there two, dairy, two days, and I'm listening to Guns N' Roses, and I'm drinking a bottle of whiskey and cut myself. <laughs> and I'm drinking, you know, Guns N' Roses, you know, turn around, bitch, I got use for you. Besides, you ain't got nothing better to do, and I'm bored, and I'm crazy. And, like, and Sister Anna tap on the door, Julie, love, are you okay? And I'm like, crazy. <laughs> I'm on my own in there, and um, like I was so crazy there. I stayed there three and a half years, and oh my god, it's so crazy, so crazy. And I was like, when I first started there, I would drink with the other girls, and then they're all Irish girls, you know. And then a couple of months into it, and now, and now I see it was alcoholism isolating me, because now I'm thinking I'm entertaining these women all day. I'm, I'm not drinking with them as well, right? So I'd find out where they were going, and I'd go somewhere different, and. Uh, and also, I didn't like that they put their makeup on and they want to go. I, like, I just want to go to my local. I just want to go across the street because that's what I want. I want to go across the street. I want to get locked in after hours where we clean up some ashtrays and uh, we play the jukebox law and we drink until 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning. That's what I'm at. I'm not at, like, normal women my age be going out dancing and makeup and all that kind of stuff. Women my age kind of annoyed me. Uh, they're so irritating. And um, my drinking really took off in a... In a in a powerful way, you know, and um, I was I was in this little room, like it was a six by three, <coughs> and um, uh, I had a big wardrobe and a huge padlock on it, and on the top was like my, my booze, my whiskey and all that kind of stuff, my razor blades, and then my clothes thrown in the bottom, and that's how I lived, and my my bin was immaculate, my trash can, I have to talk American, my trash can was, was, was immaculate, I'd never use it, and I was really kind of, everything looked good, apart from that cupboard, when you open that cupboard, you know, that was, it was a complete mess. And Sister Van used to be next door. And um, at night we had this thing where we'd put our bins out at the door at night. And the domestic staff would clean in the morning. So we'd put our trash cans out. And I'd finish all my empties and I'd put them in Anne's bin, Sister Anne's bin. <laughs> and in the morning, you know, I'd hear the domestic, the domestic staff, I don't know why they're all from Cork, but I'd hear them saying to each other, Jesus, girl. 
did you see Sister Anne's bin? I think she's a bit of an alky. And I'm like, like I, I just thought it was hilarious. Like, you could eat out of my bin, you know what I mean? But um, I told that woman, like, her reputation, everyone was like, mm-hmm. like, I just thought it was funny. I thought it was funny. And, uh, isn't it? And, uh, you know, I, I woke up one morning, I just bought this um, bright, glow-in-the-dark job, cherry tracksuit. I mean, I'm talking glow-in-the-dark. You could turn off the lights now and find me if I had that thing on me, right? So I wake up one morning, it's a Puma cherry tracksuit. I think I bought it in blackout, and I, <laughs> I that was all I ever used to wear. And, um, and I had my hair shaved on a number one because I was getting really fearful about where I was drinking. I was drinking in the East End of London, and I thought if I had my hair shaved on a number one and this cherry tracksuit, nobody would know I was female. And I could, you know what I mean, butch it up a little. And uh, <laughs> now you can't really tell from where you're sitting, but, you know, I'm kind of womanly, and... Uh, <laughs> In fact, you know, I kind of got a set of twins under my top here, and uh, it's a problem. And uh, so, like, no cherry tracks, it was covering that up, you know what I'm saying? It's like, but I thought it was in my delusion. And so I'd go over, I'd go over and have start drinking, and I'm bright red, and I've got my cherry tracks on, my hair shaved. And then I'd go, I'd go back, back over to church for evening vespers. And, um, and all the sisters, the real sisters, would be up the front. And I'd think, poor girls, they can't, poor sisters, do you know what I mean? They can't hold a tune. And I'd be there singing at the back, you know, and I'm like, Salve Regino, Mata Misericordia, Vita del Cedo, Espes Nostra Salve. And like, I'm thinking, that's why I'm helping the sisters out, you know what I mean? But they'd be looking at me like, what the hell? <laughs> like, it, we're, we're just such a joke drinking, and we'd just think, well, that and a bag of chips and... Um, you know, I was horrified, that kind of thing. And like, when I look back, I'm like, oh, my God, really? So my drinking took on this idea that I tried to control and enjoy my drinking. And what a torture that is. I mean, what torture that is. You know, like, that doesn't work for me. And uh, and I don't want to, frankly, try and control my drinking. Like, I'm not having a good time when I'm... I like to get drunk to the point where I can't feel my legs. And uh, <laughs> some kind gentleman's helping me off the bar stool. I'm like, oh, where are we going? Like, you know what I mean? <laughs> like I don't like the big book talks about you know being I you know insane more or less insanely drunk. That's how I like to drink. It's how I've always liked to drink. I don't understand the idea of not drinking like that. And I promised myself I'm only going to have six drinks tonight. And I'd get to the bar, and uh, and and you know I'd start drinking. I wouldn't even taste the first one. It's gone straight down. And then the second one, I'm getting settled in. The jukebox is starting to play. And now I'm already crying into my drink because I know I've only got four left. And um, <laughs> like I haven't finished the second one yet. And uh, and now I'm 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 sizing up the room because I'm good at that. Thinking, who can I who can I get some booze off? And uh, it's generally men who are older than my father. But uh, <laughs> I know. Thank God for blackout. Is what I say. <laughs> so you know. So, you know, my drinking was crazy and I was getting into a lot of trouble. I was going back to the nurses' quarters and I was screaming and shouting and I was cutting myself so badly I couldn't stop the bleeding and I was using my chair as a, as a toilet and um, I was really in a bad way and uh, regularly, regularly, that was like, I don't know if it was seven nights a week, it was pretty damn close and um, I, there was, people were strapping me down, I was coming so violent and uh, very violent in booze and, um, I, I, and like I'm 20, I'm 20 years of age. And, um, you know, uh, I, I had this moment, like I went to Australia, I thought, saw this advert for Castlemaine Forex, and I thought, that looks like a good place to go, and uh, Castlemaine Forex looks good, and um, and I go to Australia, and I land in Australia, and I um, I, go to one of the, I go to the Great Barrier Reef, one of the seven wonders of the world, and I'm 20 years of age, and I'm, I'm on this glass bottom boat in one of the seven wonders of the world, and I'm... <laughs> there's girls my age and they're in bikinis, right? And they're like, ooh, let's go circling, huh? Right, you know how they how they do. And uh, <laughs> and I'm thinking, look at those silly cows. Look at them. Like, I've got to take their inventory, right? So I'm sitting there with a long-armed sweater on because I've been drinking and so when I drink, I cut myself. So I'm covering my arms up and I've got a can of Foster's in my hand. And the truth is, is that I'm too embarrassed about my body 
to put a swimsuit on, let alone a bikini. Like, I'm awkward. Now, I look back at when I was 20 years of age, and, and I was banging, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, like... But at, when I'm 20, I'm like, oh, my God, I'm so fat. Right? Like, so I've got my big sweater on, and, um, and I'm drinking a can of Foster's, and, uh, and I'm watching how the, ca- how the sun is hitting the kangaroo on the can of Foster's. And I'm taking pictures, and it's such a beautiful thing. Oh, my God. Like... <laughs> That blue is so special, that blue on that can of Foster's. And, and, the, and the silver kangaroo and the little silver stars. Oh, my God, it's like a lover. Like, I remember every, remember every sublime detail of that can and how the sun hits off it. Now, I'm on, the, I'm on the seven wonders of the world. I have lots of pictures of that can of Foster's, and I have not one picture of the Great Barrier Reef. Like, Obsession. So I come back from that trip and uh, I try to control and enjoy my drinking and I try to think about, okay, I'm going to swim 100, I'm going to swim 100 laps every day. I'm a swimmer. I've always been a swimmer. Still am a swimmer. I swim a couple of miles a week. Quietens my head. It keeps my head very quiet. I like it. It's just quiet. Because I'm not, I'm not a, a joiner. So I like to swim alone where it's quiet. And, uh, and I do that about four times a week. And, um, and so I sw- I'm swimming 100 laps in 80 minutes. <coughs> And then I'm going double whiskey, double whiskey, double whiskey back to work. And people will say, because I'm lit up, you know, they're saying to me, have you been drinking? And I'd say, well, can you swim 100 laps in 80 minutes? <laughs> like, they're like, what? And I go, I didn't think so. <laughs> when you can, get back to me. <laughs> <coughs> like the arrogance. Like, that was like my plan. Like, that was how I was going to defend my drinking. And uh, I had this moment of clarity when I was 21. I just turned 21 and... Um, Somebody would upset me, and frankly, it's not difficult. Uh, you know, <laughs> like not to 16 a heartbeat. Boom! Like, wh- like it's been really hard sober. And because um, people just, you know, they're just irritating. And um, <laughs> I, I've had to work really hard. That's one of my major defects of character. And, um, and uh, you know, I have this moment, Clara. I come out, and I'm in my room. Somebody would upset me. Uh, I get my bottle of whiskey down. I'm drinking my whiskey, and I'm looking out the window. And I'm, I'm, I'm singing Patsy Cline, you know. Today I sat alone at a window, because I was at a window. I don't want to play house. No, I don't want to play house. Like, I'm alone. There's nobody there, and this is what I'm at. And so I walk over to the mirror, to the sink, and I cut myself really badly. Boom, and I'm suddenly struck sober. Suddenly I catch eyes with myself, and I'm struck sober. And I drank a bottle of whiskey. <coughs> And I remember saying to myself at that time, what am I going to do? I can't live with booze and I can't live without it. And I picked up the drink. I started drinking for another three and a half years. I got sober when I was 24 and a half. And I ended up working in a, I ended up working in a, in a retreat center with the Ursuline sisters. And um, they had done this room up lovely for me. And it was all going to be different. I was going to get sober. I wasn't going to hurt myself anymore. And I was going to get spiritually fit. And then I was going to enter religious life because I really felt that's what I wanted to do. Two days, I'm there two days, I'm drunk and I smash up my room so badly and I uh, cut myself and I'm throwing up so badly that they have to call the emergency doctor out. And I drank like that for nine months. And um, my last drink, you know, for me, like I, I realized that booze had stopped working. There's nothing worse when you drink a bottle of whiskey and your head is wide awake and your body is drunk, drunk, drunk. Like I'm now standing at the bar and I can't get, I can't escape my head and, uh, you know, I'm at the bar, and my, I can't move my body. I'm so drunk, but my head is wide awake. And I'm going, oh, my God, where are we? Oh, my God, who is this guy? Oh, my God, is that his tongue? I mean, I don't you know. <laughs> like, uh, like, you know. You know, it's like I'm playing grab ass with somebody. I don't even know, like, you know, because they're buying the booze, and I can't move. And, um, and uh, you know, oh, my God, I think I'm wetting myself. And you just can't move. You just can't move, but you're wide awake. And that is a torturous place to be, torturous place to be. And um, I have my last drink, and um, I go back to the place I should have been working, this retreat center, and there were 60 young people there having a reconciliation service. And uh, I was in, I'm completely in blackout. I don't, I'm a huge blackout drinker, so I know, I know nothing about this. It was told to me. <coughs> but there were 60 young people there, and I ended up, um, I ended up uh, apparently cutting myself so badly and going into the chapel in front of 60 young people and telling Sister Anne where to go. Yeah. I don't remember any of it. I wake up the next morning and um, I'm sick. 
I look around the room, I've smashed my room up again. My arms are ripped to bits and um, my room is all smashed up. And I walk into the bathroom and I get on my knees and I start to bring up blood. And I'm at that jumping off place the book talks about. Like I make a decision to kill myself because I know booze has stopped working. And I know I'm a loser. I'm a loser and I'm not saying that lightly. I'd never paid a bill. I'd always work somewhere where they give you your money after everything's gone out. I'd never driven a car. I'd never had a relationship. I mean, I had stalking experiences <laughs> and, uh, and obsessions. I'd follow you 10 feet behind you to the park and say it was a relationship. And uh, I had a very rich, very rich fantasy life, shall we say. And uh, <coughs> I only get arrested now for it. But, um, you know, so I'd never had any of those things. So I knew I was a loser and I knew without booze I was nothing. And what do you do if you're not in the bar 24-7? I don't understand that. I really don't understand. I'm 24. I don't understand it. And um, I make a decision to kill myself that morning on my knees. And I go upstairs. And I'm drinking some hot water. And I'm shaking. And my arms are in bits. And um, a guy who had brought the group to the house was an Irish guy. And it turned out he was nine months sober in Alcoholics Anonymous. And he 12-stepped me that morning because he saw me perform the night before. And... <laughs> And the only reason I listened to him, because I was going to kill myself, the only reason I listened to him was because he was Irish, because I thought that was my problem. I thought everybody I lived with was British. And, you know, I, I know there's a couple of British people here tonight, but... Like, like we all know the British are kind of, you know, an anal and... Um, <laughs> And that's the problem, because the Irish, we, we know how to roll, you know what I'm saying? We play. And that was part of my problem. And so I listened to him, and he 12-stepped <laughs> he me. And, um, and he brought me to my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I hadn't had a drink for four days, which is the longest I'd ever gone since I was 10. And um, I got to this meeting. It's a real smoky meeting. And um, it was like um, it was uh, April uh, 1993, which is my sobriety day. And... Um, and uh, I go into this room, it's real smoky, and people swearing and carrying on, and I liked it immediately, because I like the swearing, and uh, just like it's comfortable. And it was truly anonymous, you could really not see your hand in front of your face, you know? <laughs> Loved it, and uh, there was a woman there who started speaking to me after the meeting, and she gave me a big book, and, and I don't like women very much at this time, you know? That changed, but... Uh, uh, you know, I don't like women very much. They're, they're, they're kind of suspicious, they're, and they're not as friendly as the men. Like the men are really friendly, and, and uh, I don't like women. And, uh, and, and uh, she gave me her number, and I'm suspicious immediately, immediately. Like I don't do kind, and I don't do friendly. And uh, I know, it's so back to the warm and fuzzy business, and I just don't do it. I do now, I'm just super friendly. But um, <laughs> at that time, I didn't. And so I was really rough. Like, the book talks about that. Really unlike, unlovable, right? The alcoholic in these cups is an unlovely creature. And I was. And I was just a bitch and arrogant and sarcastic. And I shared at my very first meeting because, not saying I'm an alcoholic or anything, I'm just like, just saying. I'm just saying I, I drink and I can't stop drinking. That's all I'm saying. And people were really friendly afterwards. And they gave me a big book and gave me the number. And, I woke up the next morning, and that was the fifth day I'd ever gone without a drink, and I'd never gone that long. And I'm so crazy. I'm like, oh, my God, this, this AA business really works, right? Because I'm crazy. And um, <coughs> I have to say, I mean, I called Diane. I started to call Diane. And I have to say that, I'm sorry if you knew, but my experience is, is that when I, when I got sober, that intensity I had as a child, when I stopped drinking, came back 10 for like I was intense. And for the first 10 years of my sobriety, I had two ulcers because I'm concerned a lot. And uh, <laughs> it's a problem. And, uh, you know, I was so intense. I was living in this house and people were like, morning, Julie. And I'm like, oh my God, did I tell you this happened to me when I was five? People were like, what? Like, like crazy, crazy. And I walked everywhere. I was either really, really angry or really, really depressed. Like, I had nothing in between. Nothing in between. And I walked everywhere. I used to walk to this Wednesday night meeting. For two and a half hours. I live in California now. And I have sponsees, one of them's here tonight, who I'm like, you know, you need to walk to the meeting. Oh, oh, it's half an hour walk. I don't care. Like, you live in California, for Christ's sake. Walk and I'll meet you there. 
And uh, she actually gave me a CD one year, that song, Nobody Walks in L.A. Like, who knew? Like, like who knew? I didn't know that. I'm always learning. And uh, I used to walk two and a half hours through, through a forest, I might add, to this meeting. And I was so angry in my cherry tracksuit. So angry. And people would toot the horn and I'd be like... Because I'm like, they want a piece of this, you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm like, nobody... I look back, I go, trust me, honey, nobody wanted a piece of that. You know what I'm saying? But at the time, I thought they wanted a piece of that. And, uh, and I'd get to the meeting and people would say, Irish guys would go, Jesus, Julie, I saw you. I saw you down the road. I tooted me horn, you gave me the bird. And I thought, feck her, let her walk. And it, it was my first experience of having to be count- accountable. Because if you offended me, or if you looked at me the wrong way, I'd tell you your character, as we say in Ireland. I'd tell you what I thought of you. And then you'd try to speak, and I'd go, shh, don't speak, you'll spoil it. And I'd walk off. <laughs> so I'd never, I'd never, I'd, I'd never listen to you. Like, I've said what I need to say, you can be quiet now. And I'd wander off. And so it was my first experience of being accountable. Like, I was horrified because my ego started to come back. And they were like, yeah, you go. I'm like, oh, my God. Like, it was my first experience of not automatically just doing what I felt like. You know what I mean? Like, it was like my first practice. So I'd walk to that meeting. Cars would be tooting. And I'd be like, oh. <laughs> mm. And I'm not, really a jo- I'm not really a joiner. or never have been. I'm slightly antisocial, really, still. I have to work very hard and... and I just want to get to a meeting when it starts. I don't want to have to talk to you beforehand. And uh, <laughs> I still feel like that. I don't, I don't do that, but that's how I feel. Nobody cares how I feel, apparently. <laughs> so my sponsor tells me. So, so, <laughs> so I, I'm not, I was raised in a home that was no discipline. Like, there was a lot of violence, but no discipline. We just did whatever we felt like doing. And, uh, and so when I got sober, people would say... Uh, well, could you help me put away the chairs? And I'd be like, I'll put my chair away. <laughs> and they'd say, well, could you, could you help um, pick up the ashtrays? And i go, I don't smoke. Like, well, you know, could you help serve tea and coffee? I don't drink hot beverages. Like, like, which is a lie, I did, but I just didn't want to do anything. <laughs> like, I just don't understand this business of helping, helping, helping somebody out. And uh, like, what? Like, what? Uh, I think you're taking advantage of me, and that's not going to happen. No. You've got me confused with someone else. Like, I mean, I'd say that to people. Really warm and fuzzy, I'm talking to you. And, uh, and you know, I started to learn that, you know, in, in, in the fellowship, like, I had to start doing things, because it gets lonely. It gets lonely when you're that kind of abrasive, as some of you probably know. Uh, it's lonely, and... Um, and I'm not, interested, I'm not interested in this business of uh, sponsorship and all that carry on. I'm not interested. If I want your opinion, I'll give it to you. Like, I don't, like I'm a grown woman, really. I'm going to ask you, no. Uh, and so, you know, for the longest time I stayed sober on fellowship, just fellowship. And, um, and, um, and in, in London it was easy. So I got sober in London, so it was easy to do that. And um, I was about... I got involved in a relationship when I was about two years sober. I'm still in that. Actually, we got married last year. We'll, we'll be 20 years together in um, in uh, December. <laughs> and uh, and uh, and she's in the fellowship too. She's the same age, same length. So bright. She's actually speaking in Washington this weekend while I'm here, so it's kind of nice. We do a lot of fellowship together. And we went to Cincinnati last weekend to a convention as well. And, and uh, you know, we... we she says you'd get less for murder. I don't know. Like I'm like, 20 years? And she's like, yeah, you'd get less for murder, wouldn't you? <laughs> like, it's 15 years, apparently, for murder. Uh, so anyway, we've been together 20 years. But um, when we were together about three years, um, she said something to me that I didn't like, and I kicked the door in her face. Uh, yeah. And uh, she shot back. Now, she could kill me. She's a black belt in judo. And uh, thank God she's passive. And she shot back, and... Um, and, and I suddenly caught eyes with her, and I realized I was suddenly embarrassed. Like, I can sound good in Alcoholics Anonymous, but what am I doing when no one's watching? What am I doing when no one's looking? The idea of integrity, the idea of build, doing things when no one... Like cleaning a little coffee mug up for somebody, or putting something in the trash, or cleaning... I tried to clean down the counters at work and do all that kind of stuff. Just 
just because it tries, I tried to build some integrity. It's like character is built in the dark and um, sec, step six and seven, right? And that's what, why, and I realized I caught eyes with her and I slid down the wall. I was so embarrassed and uh, I got a sponsor. That'll do it to you, right? <laughs> God, it's this bad. I suppose I better get a sponsor. And uh, I got sore and I couldn't, I couldn't really read or write and... Um, I couldn't really read or write, and a friend of mine who was a nun helped me with my ABCs, and she showed me how to use a dictionary, and she showed me how to read a newspaper, and um, and uh, I started to kind of be able to read an AA. <coughs> and I was about three years old, so, but I started to read the big book. And I'll never forget it. I remember reading, you know in the big book where it says, half measures availed us nothing. I, I thought for three years when people read that, that they were saying, half measures of ale did nothing. <laughs> and so... Like, I'd, I'd be in meetings going, uh, yeah, Julie, alcoholic. No, half measure of ale never did me any good. <laughs> like, what the hell? Like, you moron. When I read that, I was horrified. <laughs> you know, I started to get a sponsor to do some step work. And, you know, I want to say that I, th- that woman dying who gave me her number, they always say, be careful how you treat the newcomer because they could be your sponsor one day. And, Diane, I wouldn't have stayed sober if it wasn't for Diane. And my 25th birthday was in September, and I was like five months sober. And she bought me a bottle of perfume, and um, and I was embarrassed. Like I don't, I don't do kind. And uh, at that time, and she bought me a bottle of perfume. Now, I don't want to open it in front of her. I'm awkward and uncomfortable, and and she gives me a hug, which just is creepy to me. And and uh, I go to my room and I check out how much what it was. It was a bottle of perfume. And I was not exactly girly. This is very girly now. I've even got mascara on tonight. And um, it's a lot. And uh, <laughs> and uh, I checked out how much the bottle of perfume was, and it was an expensive bottle of perfume because I wanted to see how much I was worth to die in. And um, I wore that brand for a long, long time. And about five years sober, Diane relapsed, and um, she asked me to sponsor her, and I did. And uh, I, I don't know what's happened to Diane since... Um, but, but you know, so like I would have never said so if it wasn't for her. Her kindness, it frightened me, but I was curious and um, I just didn't understand it. And um, I really didn't understand when people were kind. And um, I got this sponsor three years sober. She, she was an Irish woman and she scared me because she was kind. And I realized that's the problem, Judy. You don't, you can't be kind. Like people would call and want to speak to my partner. Hi, hi, uh, is Hilda there? You know. I'm like, oh, because she's kind. Like, I don't, I, at that time, I don't do kind. I'm really rough. This is my 100%, and I expect you to give me 100%. And if it doesn't look like my 100%, I'm going to let you know about it. That's how I was. So rough for everybody and so rough with myself. And this woman was really kind. She'd meet me. She'd give me a hug, and um, which, like, I'd be like, oh, my God, she's touching me. And, uh, and she helped me, and um, she was kind to me, and I didn't understand it, and uh, but I knew I needed... I needed to soften a little bit. And um, I went through the steps, and I have to say, like, step four was so hard for me. Like, I was always the pursued and never the pursuer. I was always the victim. Like, I was only defending myself. And trust me, I mean, there was a lot I could could complain about. I mean, there was a lot of stuff that happened in my life that should have never happened that I really was powerless over. And I was stuck in that. But the step, the fourth column of the step four really helped me. And I I looked at that. It was very painful. And... um, I got to a point where, um, you know, I really blamed my mother for everything. She was still drinking and carrying on and, and uh, blamed her for everything. And, and it so happens I went back to school at the same time. I ended up getting a degree, a bachelor's degree, and um, I, uh, I called her and told her I was getting this degree. And I was getting this degree in Canterbury Cathedral. And, um, and, and we drove down there. My mother had flown from, from Ireland to London and then got the train down to Canterbury and I hadn't seen her before the ceremony and I knew the steps were working for me because when I went out there in my hat and gown and the trumpets were blowing I was delighted with myself five years sober and I catch eyes with my mother and she's really tore back she's hung over so she's always been and she was rough and I knew the steps were working because I was just delighted she made it I was absolutely delighted she made it and it was such a change for me it was like such a spiritual awakening right in that moment and um I brought her back to the airport that night and I gave her a hug, which we don't do in our family. And I hugged her and she just said to me, I'm really proud of you. And she left. And I really worked hard on that relationship with my mom, you know. Um, 
you know, I tell my mother I love her and, um, you know, it's hard. She's got deme- some dementia right now and it's, I go home to Ireland every four months and try and take care of her. It's just hard. I call her on the phone and it's really painful. It's a painful experience for me and um, I've tried to build that relationship with my mother and, um, and she tells me she loves me too, which is so lovely. My other siblings are looking at like, like what? But the fellowship is, like, I've wanted to soften here. I was so hard, so hard. And um, and over the years, you know, I uh, my father was a different story. Like, I made a decision um, not to have any contact with my father. And there's a lot of damage done there. And I had moved from hating him once I did the step work to be numb. And I never wanted, I was like, God's time and not mine for step nine to face him. And so a couple of years gone by and... Um, he had a brain hemorrhage, and I went home to, to Ireland. I wasn't going to go home. I came to California on vacation, and somebody said, you really need to go home, and I did. I went home to Ireland, and um, I went to the hospital that day, <coughs> and I, let me tell you, I wanted to drink. I did not want to face my father nine years sober. I didn't want to face him. I was so overwhelmed by the whole experience. I was desperate to have a drink, and um, I did face him. I went to the hospital, and he was fast asleep in bed, and the nurse says, do you want me to wake him? And I started to cry, and the anger came up in me, and I was like, no. And I left. He didn't, never knew I was there. And I went to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous that night, and somebody said, why don't you read page 552 of the big book? And so I read that, which talks about praying for somebody if you're resentful, you know. And uh, I went back to the hospital that day, next day, and he was awake, and he was in a state. He'd had this brain hemorrhage, and I wiped his mouth, and I let him touch me, hug me. I brought him to the garden, and we had nothing to say. And I went to a meeting again that night, and then the next day I went back, and I went right up to him and I said, I'm going to leave now, Daddy, and you won't see me again. Like I'd made that decision through sponsorship and outside help that um, I was going to sever that relationship and it was the right thing to do. And um, uh, I said, I'm, I'm going to leave now, Daddy, and um, you won't see me again. And he started to cry. And I left. And he just says, I'm going to miss you now. He says, yeah. And I left and um, I... I mean, I cried, went into the chapel and I cried for a long, long time. But, you know, I realized that um, I'd been holding on to such anger and resentment. Like, I didn't realize that he had kind of shaped my whole idea of men, my whole idea of how I relate to people, that kind of hardness. I'm going to get the boot in before you get the boot in because I know what time it is and you're not going to take advantage of me. That's all there is to it. And I realized at that moment that I don't need that anymore. It was It left me. And um, you know, my father died three years ago, and uh, my brother called me and asked me to go home for the. Fr- he, I did, he said, "Oh, Daddy's dying," and I decided to fly home to Ireland. And um, my flight was delayed in LAX; it got cancelled. And I'm lining up for about two and a half hours with 400 other people, and uh, I get a call. My sister says, "Daddy died," so he died before I got there. And I, it was really, oh, the in, it was interesting to me. My experience, I just cried. I cried the whole time, and. Um, I was caught me off guard, and I, this, they flew me to Chicago, and they flew me 10 hours here and 10 hours there, and I cried the whole time. And it was really interesting. I called my sponsor, and I was complaining to her about being trapped behind, you know, security. And I didn't get to Ireland until Sunday, and she said to me, um, do you think, she says, it was God's way of giving you an opportunity to grieve how you need to grieve before you met your family? I'm like, no, because I think, <laughs> I think I'm just being punished, you know what I'm saying? And God blows. But uh, when I saw that, I was like, oh, okay. So I go home and I go to the funeral. And I, <coughs> the last day I'm leaving, and I'm, I'm, I'm a, uh, uh, respectful. And my brother goes, oh, we weren't expecting you. And I don't have to explain myself to people. That that's the beautiful thing. That's the freedom about being sober. I'm like, why wouldn't I? Why wouldn't I be here? And uh, that's it. End of conversation. I don't need to explain it anymore. And so I go to the grave site and I buy my father these big biscuits that he's always used to love and he was always too tight to buy them himself. And, uh, and I walk into the cemetery and I hear my father and I don't care if it sounds weird. I don't care, I'll never see you guys again. Um, <laughs> but I walk into the cemetery and I hear my father saying, oh Jesus, you bought me my favourite. And I remember saying, yeah, you're always too tight to buy them yourself, you know. And I sat down at the grave and I cried and had a good conversation with my father and I really felt like... Um, I said to him, I really hope you understand why I made the decisions that I made. Um, I'd like to think that when people pass away, they get to see the whole picture, not just the piece that you did to me. And it's a very healing experience for me. And I came back and, um, you know, I felt very free. And I wouldn't have changed anything about that experience, that, that, that relationship and, uh, you know, how I handled it. I should say in sobriety, there'd be a lot of change about it. But, um, 
You know, uh, for me, um, you know, I went back to school. I was in Los Angeles. I went back to school and I got a master's and I worked during the day and I got a master's degree. And, um, and then when I met Steve, I was doing a doctorate and I just graduated with a doctorate in May. And uh, like, 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 <coughs> it's so weird. I go to my boss, do I need to say Dr. Uh, Dr. Julie when I call? And she's like, yeah, well, you are, aren't you? And I go, oh, okay, you know, like, like it's odd to me. But it's like, here's the thing. Like, on my own, I can't get off a bar stool. I can't find the restroom. I can't, you know, I can't do any of that stuff. I didn't realize when I got sober that I was ambitious and I was driven. And I'm not smart by any means. I'm just learned the disciplines here in Alcoholics Anonymous to show up, to have some integrity, to build. I get a commitment and I stay, stick to that commitment. Like those things have really helped me in my life. Like if I live in Alcoholics Anonymous and apply what I learn here and practice what I learn, social skills and all that kind of stuff, and I take it out into my world, it seems to be very successful. So I visit the outside world and I live here. And, you know, for me, this is how I wake up in the morning. I wake up still anxious. Like, like my partner wakes up with a song, which I think is weird. But I wake up going, oh, my God, what day is it? And who wants something from me? Because you know someone wants something from you every day. And, uh, and I get up, I have a cup of tea, and I do some prayer meditation. And that's not unfancy. All I do is read page 86 to 88. I get quiet. I get quiet. And I realize that I'm not in charge. And I ask to be purposeful that day. And I ask that I lighten up my little corner of the world and I'm so grateful that I have a job to go to. I have a career. I have a life. I just got out of a clean bed. Like, I'm just so grateful for those things. You know, um, you know uh, like I said, life has its, its, its ups and downs and I'm struggling with my mother a little bit and um, it's painful. It's really painful. But I get to be a daughter and I get to have some integrity and, um, you know, I get to understand that yes, there's always the right answer in Alcoholics Anonymous and... Um, you know, I, I love, I love, it's funny, at work they asked me to do something. I was like, well, wouldn't you prefer so-and-so? He's much better qualified. <laughs> and, and my boss says, I'm not asking him, I'm asking you. The other staff members want you to do it. Something about how you carry yourself makes him feel confident in that. And, and that's, I love that. It's like, because I learned here in Alcoholics Anonymous just to show up. And, uh, and if I can't do a, a a good turn. I try not to do a bad turn, and um, you know, life life is pretty good for me. I'm, I'm you know, I'm just trying to uh, do the next indicated step. And um, most of the time, I feel fairly quiet. Most of the time, I feel like I don't need to defend myself against you. Most of the time, you don't have that kind of power over me like you used to, and that is such a sweet spot to be in. And when I when I don't treat when I'm not in prayer meditation, when I'm not talking to sponsees, when I'm not calling my sponsor. Then I start to uh, revisit um, Julie and her 100% and your 100%. So um, I'm a very uh, happy customer, and it's uh, great to be here. Thanks, everybody, for letting me speak. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.